My name's Katrina Breedis. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager for Denodo. And today I'm going to take you through a topic of adopting data virtualization for flexible and agile data and analytics use cases. So my background, just quickly, um, I've worked on a number of different data warehousing projects and analytical type projects in both a technical and product management capacity. So I'll be leveraging some of that experience today as well. So let's get started. What I thought I'd start with today is talk about the challenges uh, us as data and analytics professionals face um, and organizations face. And then we'll look at some of the approaches or alternative approaches that you can take to data delivery. So just to get started and to set the scene a little bit, I'll talk about a little bit of background in terms of how um, data has evolved over the years. And I think in the early days, back in the 80s, it was pretty straightforward. We had databases, we had file systems. To extract data or to report on data, you simply uh, ran a, an SQL query or you coded something to produce a report. But as we moved into the 1990s, that's when um, the, the, the data warehouse emerged. And um, that was primarily to offload um, the data from the operational systems and store it elsewhere. So that was um, initially um, very hard to deliver, but as um, data warehousing got more uh, mature, those projects became more successful. And then, um, we discovered that there was different types of data. So it wasn't just structured data. So we needed other solutions to um, adapt to the types of data. We had social data, cloud-based data, all sorts of different um, types of data emerging in the 2000s. And then when it came to the 2010s with big data, um, we had challenges around still integrating the data. And one of the um, uh, key things there is around um, the, uh, the inability to, um, you know, uh, work with a very distributed data ecosystem. So with big data, we used to talk about the three Vs, uh, volume, velocity, and variety. And we certainly have that in this day and age. Um, and But as we move forward, I think we've got more of a distributed type environment that we have to tackle. So that's a little bit of history. And um, at Denodo, we believe that uh, data does not necessarily have to be a destination anymore. Um, there are alternative approaches that can be used to moving data around. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail today. But first of all, I'm going to talk about the concept of a data fabric and um, which many of you would be familiar with. And it's really a, a type of approach to data delivery. So let's look at that before we get into the logical approach that Denodo provides. So what is a data fabric? A data fabric is an architectural pattern that informs and automates the de design in integration and deployment of data objects, regardless of de the, the deployment platforms and architectural approaches. So as the diagram shows there, it's really like a, a net that's cast out across all of your data, data sources across your data ecosystem. And there's a couple of key features to a data fabric. First of all, it, it needs to be able to access disparate data and integrate it very easily. Right, that's number one. Number two, it should be accessible by any consuming tool that you might have within your organization. So you're not having to shift. If I like to use Excel as my BI tool, then use Excel. If you like Tableau, then use Tableau for reporting and analytics. But having that flexibility to, uh, or agnostic uh, uh, capabilities is key. So, and then thirdly is around security, being able to manage all of the different uh, security that's required, whether that be whether you're working with PII data um, or you're working with uh, data from different areas that can't be accessed by different people. So having um, data security right down to things like data masking, if necessary, so that information is not provided to the wrong, pe you know, the wrong people at the end of the day. And then lastly, this is key, 
the ability to be able to continually improve on your analytics processes, right, and how you deliver data. Now, I remember at being a data warehouse project manager many years ago, and after several projects, we used to use an iterative approach and deliver all this data. And then after a few years, we looked back at what data was actually being used. And it was a small percentage of what we'd actually delivered. Yet we'd built all of these ETL processes and we'd moved and modeled data in different models to get different types of data to, to satisfy different business use cases. So understanding the usage of data is very, very important because it can help to save costs uh, where you're delivering data unnecessarily and making sure we're delivering data that's fit for purpose and um, aligns with the business objective. So having that um, yeah, continual improvement process from a data perspective is, is very important. So that's in a nutshell what a data fabric is. What I'm gonna talk about next is an alternative approach. Now, this is what we're terming a logical data fabric at Denodo. And it's not going to be the, the approach that you use for everything. Um, but it is something to consider for accelerating uh, your data initiatives. And we'll get into some of those facts in a minute and in terms of metrics and improvements that you can get from um, Denodo or by using a logical data fabric. So what you're looking at on the screen now is uh, Denodo in red, it, the, the red piece in the middle there. So let's just talk about this. At the, at the bottom, we have many different types of data. There's different locations, there's different structures. It can be effectively all over the place, which makes it very challenging. But it's also an opportunity to understand um, and introduce something that, that makes it a little bit easier and simplifies the architecture at the, at the end of the day. I think what we have is a very complex, um, challenging data ecosystem to manage. And, and I'll get into that a little bit further as we, as we move forward. But really it's about having access to all sorts of data, whether it's structured, unstructured, multi-dimensional, JSON arrays, whatever type of data that's needed, be able to tap into that easily. And then at the top, be able to consume that data via any application within your organization or any BI tool for that matter but it also is able to support many different personas within the business as well. So a, a logical data fabric is really an abstraction layer. We, we don't move data, we move result sets to satisfy the query that's being run or the uh, business requirement at the end of the day. So it's an, an abstraction layer where we store the metadata, we don't store the data, and we use that metadata to start modeling in a logical manner and deliver a logical view to satisfy a business use case or a business requirement. So there's some key capabilities when it comes to a logical data fabric. As I said, the abstraction layer, but that ability to give you visibility into all of your corporate data assets, regardless of where they are and leave them where they are. Recently, I was working with a, a government department in Australia, for an example, where they had a health department where they had just data all over the place, access databases, flat files, not necessarily you know, structured or in a, in, a, in a data lake or anything like that. And first of all, step one was to, to get visibility, understand what data was around the place. And a lot of that data was very sensitive data. So having the control over that data and who's accessing it is imperative and it wasn't happening. So that logical layer in the middle it means that you've not got point-to-point -point con uh, connections from every application or BI tool into the data source and the business log logic by which you combine data, access data and present data can be all centrally managed and controlled within the logical layer, which means that you don't have it replicated in each application, you've got less maintenance and you can tap in and reuse things a lot better right? It's all about reuse at the end of the day and making sure we're delivering in the most um, performant way. So providing unified data access across uh, the organization, but with that security and governance. So from a security perspective, you can have um, uh, security policies, you can have 
uh, row-based, column-based security, down to cell level, really. And you can apply different rules and policies to the data so that you can be assured that only those users that are allowed to access and see particular data sets are allowed to. Now, lastly, on, on the slide there, you'll see on the right, um, the Denoto Logical Data Platform is really made up of a couple of components. It's that uh, metadata layer. So we store the metadata, not the, da not the data. And then we have the embedded uh, optimization engine that's responsible for formulating the best query and delegating it to the sources, pushing down as much of the processing to the source systems where you've got that capability or where you can leverage that, and then returning the res results set in the most performant time. So it's really uh, working with um, the metadata as well and the statistical information that we gather from the source systems that enables the engine to know how to best formulate a query. Now, besides that, there's one other component. It's called the Denodo Data Catalog, and you'll see it on the right-hand side there on the screen. And that's really a data discovery tool for, for, for your organization. So it's for all data consumers, whether you're a novice business user or a data scientist effectively. It's a one-stop shop where you can go to, a, a user interface, web-based, that you can go to to find your data. And it, it's presenting all of that logical layer to you as data views. And you can then manage your own data sets. You can understand what other data is available. You can start to tag and categorize the information. You can add additional metadata like business metadata. You can things like data quality, um, data ownership. Um, we can see data lineage. We can see um, relationships and associations between data. So it's a really, really a, a good tool for any data consumer to, to go to find the data sample the data, make sure it's fit for purpose, share the data, collaborate with other users, uh, make recommendations to users about data sets and start to really work with the data and be more data driven, but also leverage data that exists. Why build another, yet another repository for moving data into for another use case when it's very similar to what we have over here. So it's about, you know, not having to always physicalize data and move it around that way. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about the platform. So you'll see there on the left, we've got uh, many different data sources that um, the Denodo platform is able to leverage, but there's a key technique here in the middle um, that we leverage and it's a, it's a concept called data virtualization. So data virtualization is it's like if you're from it, well, most of you would have some sort of data background. So if you've got database background and you, you, you know there's physical tables and then you'd build a view, a logical view across those tables to produce um, a particular joined integrated data set, similar concept, but we're talking across many different types of data, different structures, different locations, and really providing that simplicity to be able to not only access data, but model data very quickly and easily. And lastly, well, a couple of things here. There's two things. One, when you're in a position like a data virtualization layer, you're able to understand the usage of data. We track who access, accesses what data and when and how. That's all logged in log, audited in log files. So that information is data in itself. It's active metadata that can be very useful in determining what users might need or how to accelerate and better improve some of the performance of the data consumer type inquiries or queries that are being run. So, um, yeah, th so that's uh, one concept. And uh, the other one was around, let's go to the next slide. These are the different capabilities, really. I'll work through them. So if we start um, at the top there, and I'll get into this one a little bit more as we um, get through the presentation. What we're able to do with those usage statistics that I talked about is run algorithms, machine learning algorithms against that data to determine the what data should be recommended to certain uh, data consumers. So if my colleagues um, and I'm in a similar group, user group or role, 
we can leverage that type of information to recommend certain data sets. But more than that, if we've got uh, users that need to, that are querying the operational systems or source systems, um, then, uh, and there's many of them doing the same sorts of queries and we don't want them all hitting the operational system, we can start to um, provide a summary or recommendations on summary data that can be provided to the users. And we can start to cache data and offload it from the off operational system if it needs to be. Because not all operational systems or source systems can be queried. We understand that. There's SLAs involved and all sorts of constraints with those systems. So we have to be careful about accessing the data directly. But the other key thing is we're able, by accessing the data directly, we're able to deliver data in real time, not near real time because we're modeling it and moving it to get the end result. So we've built in some AI uh, and ML type recommendations, but we've also, um, as I said, the active metadata, we've got the advanced semantics that allow us to, um, you know, add different metadata, but also leverage that metadata um, to understand the usage patterns as well. Then we have the security and governance layer. So, uh, you know, when, when you've got really that centralized layer for, for, for control, but with your decentralized data. And I've talked about real time already, but it's really about, you know, doing the data integration in um, the same type of way you would do, but in a logical form so that you're not having to reproduce the same logic across different processes. And we've got the smart query acceleration as well. So that's about, as I said, creating those summaries. So there's a lot of um, uh, capability within the logical data platform that, that makes it um, very powerful. So how does AI fit into all of this? As I said, it's a continual process that we need to improve on um, and uh, satisfy the business users. So this is an, a screenshot basically of the data catalog that I talked about. And it's uh, a web-based tool. As you'll see, it has um, all of the data sets that are available to me that I have access to, and it, it shows me which ones I frequently use and makes recommendations for data sets. But it gives me a, a snapshot of all of my data sets that I have uh, access to. And with the uh, AI capability that we've built into the product, as I mentioned, we can start to leverage the, the, the usage patterns of data and better service the business from a data perspective as well by the engine recognizing what data needs to be delivered to these users. And finally, how does this really stack up in the real world? Um, we've got many customers out there using Denodo. However, what we uh, conducted uh, recently at the, the end of last year was a study across many customers that use data, data that use Denodo's data virtualization um, platform. And this study was conducted by Forrestar, and it's called the Total Economic Impact Report. And it's the impact of using data virtualization, what that means to an organization. So right here, you'll see that um, with, within this report, what we determined was that there was 83% reduction in time to value. And why is that? Um, it's because, as I mentioned, there's a reduced amount of data movement. So therefore you're not having to build and maintain the processes or the data pipelines that you're using to move the data. And that can really start to reduce if you, and if you look at streamlining how you're doing that and taking a logical virtual approach. The next one there is um, that came out of the report was that, that there was seen to be a 67% reduction in data preparation tasks as well. And why is that? It's because, as I mentioned earlier, because we're building and maintaining that logic for bringing data together and integrating data in one centralized place. So that means that we can repurpose that and reuse it as well. And we're not having to build it for each different pipeline or process that might be delivering data. And then uh, there, there's much more to this report than these ones. Uh, these are the key kind of uh, you know, benefits that you can gain from using data virtualization. The third one there is a 65% decrease in the delivery times over ETL. And why is that? It's because we're doing it in a logical fashion. We're not, um, we're accessing the data directly. We're not having to build and model data for different types of concepts. You still need to do some, we still need to physicalize some data for different requirements, but where 
possible, if you can access the data directly, it does accelerate and remove a lot of overheads. Um, so lastly, there, um, there's, a few, there's several other metrics actually, actually from 65% um, faster delivery through optimized queries. So that optimized en engine that we have helps to build the most effective queries and run in the most performant time. But the one that was really interesting that came out of this study was around 50%, um, no, knowledge workers um, were found to be more productive, 50% more productive. And that's because of the data catalog. They're able to find the data that they needed very quickly and easily and leverage that and repurpose data that's already there rather than rebuild an yet another data set. So that's just some of the um, benefits of leveraging data virtualization for your data and analytics type initiatives. So just to sum up, um, okay. So as mentioned, we have a very complex data ecosystem. And I know a lot of people, a lot of our customers talk about simplifying that environment and a data fabric approach particularly a logical data fabric approach can really help to simplify the architecture. You still have the underlying complexities, but it removes the complexities from the data consumers. They don't need to be concerned about how to uh, connect to a data, different data sources, how to bring data together. They simply connect to Denodo, find the results that they're after and, and, and they're often, often racing. A logical data fabric also encourages uh, stronger data governance. So you've got that capability to um, know who's accessing what data, but also introduce the security that you require to ensure that your data assets are delivered in a secure fashion. And the big one here is the, the reduction in the effort that's required by IT. I, I'm sure you've all experienced, um, you know, the bottlenecks that IT can, can uh, provide. Um, when it comes to data delivery. And quite often, if you've got more of a self-service model, not just having BI tools, but having the data discovery component as well, which I believe completes that self-service model, then you're able to have um, or leverage more self-service within the organisation and take that strain off IT so that they can start delivering more as well or focus on other projects. And um, lastly, you know, having that data catalog helps to, um, with data democratization and ha helps analysts at the end of the, the day as well to find data and also bring together different views of data. So leave the technical bits to the IT department on how you connect to data, how you build those joins, but allow that to be leveraged by business users so that I can join different views together as well based on underlying um, um, relationships that have been built into the logical platform. And that really is, 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 is key. So with that, that concludes the um, presentation today. Um, if you- Thank you, Katrina. I think there, there's a question on Slido. So could you use say existing bank opt-in customer data in your logical data fabric or what steps would be needed to first move data in that format? Like what's the precursor to getting the data into the data fabric, I think is the question. So I just talked about not having to move data. So you don't move data into, into the logical data fabric. First of all, um, the data remains where it is in most of the cases, unless there is a, a problem with accessing the source. And then we can look at alternative ways to store that data. It could be in a case using uh, existing, leveraging existing technology or, um, another method um, could be identified as best. So what's the, so we've got many banking customers, um, Credit Agricole speak for us uh, quite often about their logical data fabric. Um, in terms of steps that would be needed to move the data, we don't move the data, as I said, but step one, we, we identify areas where we can make improvements by taking a logical approach. We do it on a use case basis but it's, it's just like data warehousing. You, you do it in an iterative fashion. You start with one use case, you introduce the layer, and then you add more data and use cases as you go. So it's, it's a very effective approach. Thank you. Join me in thanking Katrina uh, for that insightful presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.